Today, in another edition of our mini-series Discovery Makers on the Discovery Matters podcast, we have a full-blown superstar to talk to. Oh, I feel fanboy moments coming on. They Who will. are we talking to today? Oh, we're talking all things vaccines. And the way we're going to do that is to hear from Mustafa Bitaya, who recently helped develop the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine for COVID-19. So this is proper science royalty. This is celebrity. This is, um, well, this is kind of very, very exciting. And I guess that's what matters on today's episode of Discovery Matters. My name is Dr. Mustafa Bide. Um, I worked at the Jenna Institute here at the University of Oxford. I am involved in the development of vaccines against imaging and outbreak viral pathogens. So before we get to Oxford and the vaccine, how did it all start for him? Ooh, to hear that, let's go way, way back and let's travel far from where we are, Connor, to the Gambia. When I was growing up, I didn't come from a very fortunate family in terms of, you know, wealth. I come from a very humble background. And for me, education was something that was seen as a way out of poverty. And it was also something that was seen as something very prestigious in society. I didn't see a lot of people in my family um, to motivate me to become what I am and also to pursue my academic career in a way that, you know, I strive for perfection and, or excellence in everything I do. Eventually, Mustafa started his scientific career working at the Medical Research Council there, which is funded by the UK government. This work gave him the opportunity to see in real life the impact that science can have on the lives of people around him. And for me, I also have the opportunity whilst there to witness the clinical trial of the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine which goes on to be introduced um, in our national immunization program, childhood immunization program. And I've seen in real life the impact the introduction of that vaccine in the country's childhood immunization program have in terms of reducing severe disease caused by pneumococcus, but also in terms of death um, caused by pneumococcus. So out of all the potential scientific disciplines that he could have pursued, what was it that really drove him to working on vaccines? Well, it's actually quite a sad story, and it relates to people around him not being vaccinated. I lost uh, my elder brother to measles, and the only reason why measles is no longer a major health problem in low- and middle-income country is down to the widespread use of the middle vaccine, measles vaccines, in those parts of the world um, through the expanded program of the WHO. So for me, it's down to a personal encounter I have in life and the impact I see in real life growing up that vaccines have in terms of improving child mortality in low and middle income countries, particularly in my country, in the Gambia. And then one day, Mustafa got good news, which brought him to London. Coming to London to study on a scholarship that was given to me by the University of Westminster is always the thing I reference as the landmark moment that changed my life. So the only reason that was able to that was possible is because science transcends border. So the work I was doing was something um, I was doing with colleagues from across the world. Some of them were from the UK, some were from other parts of the world. So it was a very diverse environment. With science, you can go anywhere. With science, you can walk anywhere. But with science also, you can benefit not only your community, but every community across the world. And after that, Mustafa then went to Oxford. So coming to Oxford here to work at the Jenna, developing vaccine for imaging and outbreak pathogen, What that opened my eyes to um, is the opportunity to know that you can walk anywhere in the world in science and still be able to produce meaningful differences um, in people's lives. I want to hit line drive. Want to lose weight and keep it? Deadly disease has appeared for the first time in the U.S. It's easy to forget it, but COVID-19 is not the first coronavirus out there. It's called Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, the MERS virus for short. That's right. Back in 2012 in June in Jeddah in Saudi, 
uh, we had the first case of um, of MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. I remember that. Uh, that was a big deal. That particular coronavirus belongs to the same family with the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus that's currently responsible um, for the global pandemic. And Mustafa was one of the first scientists out there to work on that virus. And the work me and my colleague did in the development of that vaccine, which was a phase one trial, where we looked at the safety and immunogenicity of that vaccine. And a small number of people in Oxford was the blueprint for our COVID-19 vaccine trial. The work we did in that trial allows us to be in a position where we can develop a vaccine based on the spike protein of a coronavirus. Mustafa says that the data he and his colleague got from that trial basically set the scene in terms of what he and the team went on to do with the COVID-19 vaccine. So the trial's got a lot of focus on the COVID-19 side of things. So how exactly do they work and what was Mustafa's role during these trials? We have two primary immunological readouts that we use to measure the immunogenicity of the vaccine. I optimized and standardized as well as validated the ELISA method that is used for measuring the antibody response in people who are vaccinated. In addition to that, I also developed the data processing and management workflow to enable data integrity and end-to-end data traceability, as well as put the system in place for monitoring the performance of the RCA, as well as the quality control of the data. So can we just really zoom in on the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine for a moment? Talk me through the discovery here. How did it happen? Oh, it's a fantastic story of failing in order to succeed. So when Mustafa started the trials, he actually wasn't expecting to fail at all. Most of the time in science, people fail more often than they succeed. But for us, our tax and our objective was set on succeeding. Some of the challenges was with regards to the amount of time we were spending in the lab. It's something we haven't done before. So we were spending like very long hours walking. And this is something we were doing um, week in, week out. So it's not something we were doing like for five days, but something we were doing for seven days a week. Something also we've been doing for many, 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 many months during the pandemic at a time when people were in lockdown and at a time when people were social distancing and at a time when people were dying from the virus. So we know we were in a race. Um, I mean, I cannot imagine the intensity of the pressure that the team must have felt under. It must have been almost unbearable. It was intense. And Mustafa says he could almost feel the heat of the spotlight on him as he and the team were searching for an effective vaccine. I think this is the first time that, you know, Scientists have given have been given this amount of coverage when it comes to the media and also the amounts of recognition for the work that they have been doing. And for us, the spotlight has been on us continuously, so which also was an added pressure in the sense that people were closely, you know, keeping an eye on what we were doing and were expecting something great from the work we were doing. So that expectation alone was something else. So how do you keep going during something like that? How do you not crumble under the pressure, under the expectation of like 9 billion people that need what you're working on? I knew if it were, if it, if it's successful, you know, we'll have a wide global reach, you know, because of its affordability, but also, you know, the ability to deploy it to other parts of the world where the infrastructure is not as great as this part of the world. So I knew the vaccine I was involved in developing will have a greater impact in fighting this pandemic, particularly in other parts of the world that are less fortunate, including my own country in the Gambia. And that vision for me is what kept me going and is what gave me the opportunity to keep focus on the tax and to know that the work I was doing will eventually, if successful, have a greater impact in fighting the pandemic. But you know, the hardest part of the process, besides all that pressure, was the pace of the thing, speed. The magnitude of the tax was huge. We were walking at a much faster pace and it, the environment was so dynamic, you know, things were changing, things could change in a split second. And the adaptability that, and flexibility that the team showed to deliver 
and whatever objective was set aside was amazing. And for me, that teamwork and collaboration is something I haven't seen before in my entire career. Yeah, it just goes to say that, um, you know, with teamwork and collaboration, as humans, you know, we can achieve, you know, anything we want. So there was Mustafa in Oxford basically saving the world, but back home in the Gambia, his family didn't really get what he was doing. It took me many, many years to explain to my family, particularly my mom, the impact of the work I was doing, how it can change lives, because most of it was quite fundamental biology, whereby, you know, most of the time, uh, what you do doesn't get translated although it can inform policies that can be taken um, by certain decisions. When it comes to certain decision making and policies by certain government agencies, our work can be very useful. So she always asks me, when are you going to stop? When are you going to finish all this learning? You know, how long is it going to take you to, you know, do all of this and, you know, start to settle down? So now, what does his mother say? So my mom was fortunate to be one of the people who was offered the AstraZeneca vaccine in the Gambia. And she now came to the realization that the work I've been doing, this is the kind of benefit and impact it can have. And she's now able to understand and relate to what I do. And I think now she can understand that the whole journey was to make me a better scientist, but also to prepare me for greater things like this. And I'm glad now that, you know, she's proud of me and understands what I do. And I think she's happy that I've had make such an impact um, to people's life at a time of need. And no matter where he is in the world, Mustafa still holds tight to his roots back in Africa. Yeah, um, that's true. Uh, my inspiration, I draw inspiration from where I come from, and I also draw inspiration from where I am now. So for me, um, looking back, I always use that as a way of validating the fact that you can start where I started and end up where I am now, or even surpass where I am. So it's just a way of inspiring other people, but also inspiring, getting inspiration myself from my roots, knowing that where I came from is good enough to set a foundation that I can use to get to where I am now. And I've been glad and fortunate to be part of the team that developed this vaccine, which goes on to be used worldwide. And as I speak with you, um, over one billion doses have been administered worldwide, including in my country, back in the Gambia. This just goes to show that um, science is the greatest collective endeavor that humanity has known. So as you can imagine, there are some long-term effects uh, thanks to the experimentation of Mustafa and his team and, in fact, other teams who were working so quickly under such great pressure to bring a vaccine for the COVID-19 pandemic. Mustafa has a few comments on the way vaccines are developed as a result of everything that has happened during the pandemic. Yeah, the platform technologies that are used in the development of the COVID-19 vaccine have revolutionized the way we're going to be developing vaccines in the years to come. So now you kind of get to that really aggravating question that journalists often ask when they can't <laughs> think what else to ask. It's like, how does it feel? But really now I'm, you know... That's not I an really annoying question. That is the question. But how does it feel then, having done what he's done? Yeah, I mean, to do what we have done feels really great. When we do it, what we have at the back of our mind is to benefit humanity. And to be able to do that in our lifetime, for me, really means a lot. I'm fortunate to be part of a team that share the same passion I have, which is to do whatever we can to bring added benefit to humanity, but also to make a difference to people's life. Not only people in our local communities, but people in other communities across the globe. I hope that we don't have another pandemic, but I hope that if we have one, that people will be in a position to say, okay, we're gonna develop a vaccine within three months rather than a year, because we've been able to do it in a year. And I hope that people will take a lot of inspiration from the work we've done to be able to go on and achieve greater things. Look, that's just remarkable. It, it's such an inspiration. And look, I, I need to add my personal thanks, right? That stuff went into my arm um, yeah. uh, as soon uh, uh, as I was eligible for it here in the UK. I have and, the and Pfizer. I think we also, 
but still you had I, Pfizer. Yeah, but I think that the Astra was just a a pioneer. And absolutely, I think we are all fortunate to be in the company of such remarkable scientists. I think we have to acknowledge the fact that there's some irony in Mustafa coming from the Gambia and countries like the Gambia and others in the global south still, still suffering from access. vaccine inequity, don't have access to um, the work that has been developed. Uh, and, and this is, you know, frankly, we can be honest, uh, an element of social injustice that we as a global scientific community and governments around the world have to do a better job on. Connor, let's talk about that on a future episode of Discovery Matters. What do you say? I think we should. The equitability of biomedical progress. How does that sound as an episode? And if you want to hear that, let us know and share some suggestions for someone we should interview. Superb. Rate us on uh, the rating thing, and we'll see you when we come back with another episode of Discovery Matters. Thanks for listening. Discovery Matters executive producer is Andrea Killen. It was produced with the help of Bethany Grace Armit Brewster. Editing, mixing, and music by Tom Henley and Banda Production. My name is Dodie Axelson. And I'm Connor McKechnie. Okay, that's it.